Rory coordinates recruitment, development, and external collaborations at the Foundational Research Institute, a prioritization research group that focuses on strategies to prevent worst case scenarios that could occur due to risks from advanced artificial intelligence. Previously, he, read, he led the Effective Altruist Fundraising Project, Raising for Effective Giving, where he helped fundraise millions of dollars for highly effective charities. Please welcome Rory Donnelly. And as always, uh, you can ask questions um, on the Bizabo app. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here today. And thanks to the organizers of this great event and for the great introduction. Um, so uh, my name is Rory Donnelly, and uh, I work for a prioritization research group called the Foundational Research Institute. We're primarily interested in S risks or worse than extinction scenarios that could occur as a result of artificial intelligence. So today I'll be talking about uh, one research area that's particularly relevant for managing such risks, um, but it's also one that's relevant for effective altruists more broadly, regardless of which specific cause they're interested in, and that is moral trade and cooperation. So first, I'm just going to introduce the idea of moral trade and moral cooperation uh, with some thought experiments about how it works. And then I'm going to explain its relevance to effective altruism, um, to moral advocacy. And finally, I'm going to present a new paper that we've just recently published on cooperation through correlated decision making. So let's start with the idea of moral trade. And to introduce this, I'm going to use a thought experiment from the original paper on the idea by EA philosopher and one of the co-founders of effective altruism, Toby Ord. So in this example, Victoria and Paul are close friends, and Victoria is a vegetarian, while Paul donates 10% of his income to organizations that most effectively combat global poverty. So one day, the two decide to make an agreement. Paul is going to become vegetarian, while Victoria is going to donate 1% of her income to these similar organizations uh, that try to uh, mitigate the effects of global poverty. So by uh, partaking in this trade, both Victoria and Paul can gain more of what they value. It's more important to Victoria that there's an additional vegetarian and that additional animals are saved than that she has this 1% of her income. And it's more beneficial um, to Paul uh, that someone donates 1% of their income um, to effective global health interventions uh, than the cost to him of personally being vegetarian. So we can see that this is analogous to normal trade that happens between businesses or individuals where each party trades away something uh, that's less valuable to them than what they're receiving in return. And in this way, everybody can benefit. So things can become uh, even more interesting if people sometimes have values which are opposing in some way. And again, to go back to Ord's paper on the topic, the example used here is gun rights and gun control. So in this example, Rebecca is a defender of the right to bear arms, while Christopher is uh, in favor of more gun control. And a new bill is currently being debated on this topic in Congress. So it turns out that Rebecca is interested in donating $1,000 to a charity that's going to fight against the bill, and Christopher is planning to donate $1,000 to an organization that will fight in favor of the bill. So if we assume that maybe these two organizations are roughly equal in their effectiveness, then we can see that the net impact of a $1,000 donation to each organization uh, might be roughly zero. And so when we consider these two organization, uh, donations together, it might be that they basically have no impact and that they cancel each other out. So Rebecca and Christopher decide to make a similar agreement and they decide that they will each donate their $1,000 to a different organization that they both agree is mutually beneficial. For example, an organization uh, that improves outcomes for people in developing countries. So a way in which this is relevant to effective altruism is that we also uh, see this kind of moral advocacy in the work that we want to do. And there are uh, values and norms that we would like to promote. But if there are other groups or people or organizations who are promoting opposing views, then it may be the case um, that a lot of this impact is canceled out or that the net result uh, might be roughly zero. And instead, if these two groups can decide to instead use these resources on a project that they both agree is mutually beneficial, then uh, the total overall impact can be higher. 
So another way in which moral trade and cooperation can be relevant to effective altruists is in the case of public goods or community goods. Uh, so these are products or services that are going to be every, uh, benefit everybody in the community or in some group. So one way to think about this is that perhaps instead of promoting uh, your specific favorite cause area, in addition to this, it's possible to promote this cause area while at the same time promoting effective altruism as a whole. So then maybe some people who hear your message but uh, who aren't so compelled by your cause area will still become involved in effective altruism and find their way to another cause area. And then if you expect uh, that other effective altruists who are interested in a different cause area do the same thing, then this will also, in expectation, lead to some people to find their way to your cause area. And again, in this way, everybody can benefit than if they hadn't participated in this activity. Um, so uh, in addition to this, uh, some other things which um, are useful in terms of public goods or community goods are things like promoting beneficial epistemic norms or setting up useful infrastructure that everybody can use. And so the Effective Altruism Global Conferences are a very good example of that. And some other things might be, uh, for example, the EA Forum or various other things that everybody can benefit from. So finally, um, I'm going to present uh, the idea from one of our new papers, which is on multiverse-wide cooperation through super rationality. So this is quite a counterintuitive idea, um, and a new paper has just been uh, published on this by one of our researchers, Kaspar Osterheld. So the basic idea is that if we expect that we live in a spatially infinite universe, uh, so a Tegmark level one universe, but this idea will also work if we live in a Tegmark level two or three or four uh, multiverse, um, then most of our uh, cooperation partners are very, very far away from us. So far that it's not possible to communicate with them or for there, for, for there to be any contact. So the kind of cooperation outlined uh, at the beginning of this presentation isn't going to be possible. In fact, it may not even be, it may be very hard to even know what kind of values uh, these potential collaborators are going to have, and then it's going to be very hard to benefit them if we're not exactly sure what their values would be. However, given that we might have uh, some guesses about the kind of processes that brought these other agents about, perhaps they came about through evolution, for example, this may give us some evidence about what their values are likely to be, and uh, therefore we may be able to make some guesses through this or through other means about what we could do to benefit them. But unfortunately that still won't be enough because we still can't have uh, causal contact with these other agents and um, so it's not possible to, to make the cooperation work. So this is where the idea of super rationality comes in. And so for people familiar with uh, decision theory, you'll see that that's relevant here. Um, so for example, causal decision theory precludes uh, super rationality, but other decision theories such as evidential decision theory or uh, what Mary calls logical decision theories allow it. And so the basic idea here is that there are mutual assumptions um, by which super rationalists collectively uh, come to decisions. And um, therefore, by observing, if you're a super rationalist, by observing your own decision, this gives you some evidence about uh, the decisions that other super rationalists uh, will make. Uh, so that is, if I'm a super rationalist and I behave um, in a cooperative fashion, uh, then it makes it more likely, uh, or it gives me evidence that other super rationalists are also uh, behaving in a more cooperative fashion. So obviously this is very tentative, very speculative, and there are lots and lots of additional caveats and additional information uh, that you can check out in our paper. Um, but finally, I'll just give a few uh, concrete points uh, from this paper. And as I said, if you're interested, uh, please check it out. And there's much more information uh, on this idea. So some things that Osterheld argues um, may be beneficial if we take uh, this line of reasoning and this idea seriously are things like promoting causal cooperation, promoting moral pluralism, moral reflection, and super-rational cooperation. And in particular, he thinks it's important uh, to promote these ideas to our future descendants who we might expect will have much more information and be smarter and be better able to figure out how to put this idea into practice. And one particular special case of uh, all of this might be that it may be particularly important to promote these ideas and these values um, to future advanced AI systems uh, that we may create so that they can reap the benefits and the gains from trade. Um, 
from this idea. So as I said before, there are many more details, many more caveats, and much, much more information in this paper, which you can uh, find on our website. And so this is our website, foundational-research.org. And uh, if you have any questions or anything you'd like to add, feel free to grab me at any time during the conference, or you can email me at rory at foundational-research.org. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we do have some questions for you from the Bizabo app, if you have a few more minutes. Um, OK, so our first question. Do you think that democracy is or could be an effective mechanism for large-scale, large multi-party moral trades and for dealing with the tragedy of the commons in that context? If it could be but isn't, what's missing from democracy as a mechanism for this sort of thing? So thanks for making that one particularly easy for me. I think uh, democracy is a, is a great example of um, this kind of thing working in practice. And um, obviously, with a lot of these things, you can add a lot of caveats and include ways in which uh, things uh, seem to break down and not work so well. Um, but in general, uh, yeah, this seems like um, one really great achievement uh, of humanity and something that seems to uh, work extremely well, all things considered. All right, and the second question we have is, how are we supposed to connect with and find other people interested in moral trade? Because it seems like very few people understand or are willing to do this. Do we need some kind of a moral marketplace? Thanks, um, yeah, so that's a great question. and. I think um, in effective altruism, luckily, um, quite a few people are starting to uh, pick up uh, this idea. So for example, uh, Stefan Schubert um, is working on this, and I believe Owen Cotton Barrett and Ben Garfinkel um, also, uh, I think they have a paper with uh, Stefan Schubert. We're all also interested in this idea, and um, uh, other people as well have been writing about it and uh, are interested in this idea. Um, in the broader context of the world at large, it can be harder to um, find people who are interested in moral trade. Uh, but we do see some examples of this, for example, um, with voter trading uh, that sometimes happens and things like this. And these, these seem like the kind of platforms, potentially, that could also be a, a very interesting avenue for, um, for further work. And do you have any final practical advice for setting up moral trades if we want to put this into practice now? Right, so as you said, the idea of a moral marketplace could be very interesting, and I know that this is an idea that's been floated uh, several times in effective altruism. So um, if somebody's particularly interested in uh, setting up some kind of platform to make this work, um, then uh, maybe we could discuss it, and I think there's a lot of other people who are interested in, in having uh, something like this get off the ground. Unfortunately, there are a lot of things that make this very difficult, um, but uh, it's something that I'd definitely love to see. Right. Thank you so much, Rory. Thanks. Thank you.